This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Alison McFarlane. Hi, Ray. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming down. My pleasure. Good to be here. I uh, I interrupted you as you were half telling a story because I wanted to start the podcast. You are saying uh, you were talking in the office about podcasts. I was, and I must admit I'm not uh, a frequent user of podcasts, but with uh, the popularity of uh, XY and all the podcast downloads, I'm sure to become one. But no, in the media just this week about the um, – The murder mystery case up on the northern beach is being cracked open because of a podcast. I haven't heard about it. So what what, what, what happened? Yeah, well, it's rather nasty. It's a, um, a, a, I think it's almost a 40-year-old murder case that's gone gone cold. But um, the the husband is now being accused of of murdering his wife um, and had had an affair with a girl at the school that he was a teacher at. And um, the media have just come in and bulldozed his pool and all this sort of where the house where they lived. And it's all due to uh, this podcast, apparently. Do you remember what it was called or what it the is podcast. called? Yeah, no. <laughs> Teacher's Pet. Okay, Teacher's cool. Teacher's Pet. I know true crime is definitely becoming a thing. Um, what what got me massively into podcasts is is something called Serial. Mm. Um, and this was a, a series basically of, a, of an unsolved, well, it, it's a guy uh, by the name of Anan, I think it was, and he's, he's, in, a, he's in prison and uh, this, this uh, podcast producer took time to actually investigate it and she sort of was recording as, as she interviewed him and researched the facts and mm. dived, d- dove into inconsistencies and mm. really fascinating and I think that kind of opened the, the bonnet for, for mm. true crime. Yeah. My yeah. mum and my sister absolutely love it. They're, they're always telling me to listen to stuff as well. Well, cool. Mm, mm. And, and what's been happening otherwise? Ah, well, just um, getting out and about. Winning awards? Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, was, what was the award that you, you won? Uh, it was back in March. It was um, the Positive Progression of Women yep. um, from the Financial Executive Women Association. Okay, cool. And, and are they uh, fi- just financial services? Or yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, the, the association, or FEW as it's known, was um, formed around five years ago, just had um, the fifth year um, anniversary with a round of conferences in March and it's designed to sort of set up an advocacy program for women in financial services that are looking to learn from other women, um, mm-hmm. both more senior than them um, and then become an, um, become an advocate for those younger, uh, less experienced that are looking for guidance in their careers. Is there is there a lot of younger women looking to get into finance as a career? Are you finding that that's sort of happening more and more? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and coupled with the work I'm also doing with um, the Financial Planners Association, uh-huh. um, the FPA, they've now got um, a specific uh, student engagement team that are working with students mm-hmm. studying uh, commerce or business and guiding them into careers in financial planning because, yeah. you know, let's face it, there's going to be, you know, a large gap um, in yeah. financial planning once um, the older planners, you know, leave the industry over the next few years. I, uh, you know, we, we, we obviously talk about this uh, at XY quite a lot, but it, I just, I, I sort of fast forward 10 years and I look at the average age of an advisor and, you know, there's going to be a lot of books getting sold at a time where a lot of legacy mm-hmm. uh, revenue streams are going to be turned off at a time where wealth is probably going to change a generation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting I, to, to recruit people into financial services at the moment because I don't know that the industry is going to look anything like it does today when they've actually established in the industry. It's, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, it is an exciting time. It's, it's, um, I guess the world's the oyster for, for people that are of any age, really, that are prepared to grow and change and, and become more professional. Mm. Um, 
over the next uh, few years. So, you know, I've always been a big advocate for financial planning as well. I've worked with advisors um, and alongside advisors for, for a long time now. Yeah. So with, with few, what, what, how, how, what's their presence like? Do they, uh, do they work with the likes of the FPA or do they yeah. go to universities? What's their kind yeah, of? Yeah. So few was, um, as I said, set up five years ago, um, predominantly with, um, the larger banks and institutions, um, to help develop their people, um, to help them develop their careers and, and, and so on. And then in recent times, only in the last 12 months or so, they've formed a, a, a partnership with the FPA mm-hmm. to, to build that out for financial planners. So for female females um, within financial planning that want to um, work with a more experienced financial planner um, and vice versa. Mm. So that's starting to come through. And I guess my my experience has sort of been a, a bit of an evolution. So around about early 2000s, um, I saw a bit of a gap. There was no formal groups like financial executive women, um, you know, there to, to support um, women trying to you know, get to know each other and trying to build uh, corporate relationships with each other. Uh, so myself and a, and a colleague set this peer group up and for around about 15 years we ran that um, with uh, senior women in uh, licensee positions, research roles, platform roles um, and, and a couple of financial planners. And, and yeah, and over time we, we would meet every quarter in a boardroom and we'd have a, a professional agenda. And I guess the the values that we, um, that we held dear were around confidentiality around professionalism and around an open sharing culture mm-hmm. and and these this sort of thing has become more formalized you know today in in more um of the of the work we're trying to do in the in the broader community mm. so and uh, does that because it's, it's clearly women women only and is, is does that come from the i guess way back when or even today i mean I, i'm kind of talking out of school but is mm. it is there still a real kind of thing that that women are dealing with in yeah it's a really it's a it's a it's a controversial and an interesting topic yeah and you, you'll talk to probably me on a different day and you might get a different answer <laughs> um you won't but, be held to anything you but say but <laughs> certainly but certainly when you know it, around um the turn of the century, you know, making me sound very old, but <laughs> around 2000 when this was started, it was very difficult. You know, a lot of a lot of our colleagues in distribution, financial services were playing golf or going to the pub all afternoon. And, yeah. you know, for, for many women, they simply either don't have the interest to do those sorts of activities or um, are, are unable to because of other commitments outside of, of work time. So, um I think that there's that, um, but more recently, I think we're seeing a lot more of a balancing of um, young, particularly younger financial planners and and um, financial services uh, professionals coming through. Mm. You know that they, they go to university. A lot of them are fifty fifty in commerce or business studies. Gender split wise, yeah. Um, and then you see that in the early early t- time of being in the in the workforce or setting up their own businesses, etc. But mm. something has happened, you know, later on, you know, around um, uh, the time they're having children, you know, starting a family, and I think that is still um, pretty much a real um, experience that people have today. Um, again, I'm being controversial, but it, and not all not all people are affected by having family you know yeah. a lot of professional yeah. women that I work with either don't or never will have a family yeah. um, or not yeah not that way or, or it doesn't affect their um, their ability to do their job or it, nev- it never should affect the ability it's more around um, the commitment and the time that they can put in after hours and yeah things like that it's uh, look I to say something controversial I, I I've, I've thought about it a bit and and you know for me, for me, having a career, having children, and and you know, family life, it it, it never needs to come at the cost of no. of the other. Um, but but for for women, clearly, it's a different story because you know you're literally going to have a child, mm. or you know that yep. that disrupts the flow. And I just wonder because you know we 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 do see um, uh, you know, pay inequality and those sorts of things, and clearly those stats are still happening. Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't know the numbers in this, but I'd be really keen to learn, you know, is, is that is, and I imagine there is still a bit of, uh, you know, prejudice and those sorts of things that, mm. that, that creates that. But I also wonder if, if you're, I don't know, uh, a 25 year old, uh, woman working, working in say financial services, mm. uh, you know, you, you, you in a relationship, mid twenties, late twenties, have a, have a baby, um, you know, maybe take a couple of years out. Mm. 
and then and then start your your priorities may may then start to change, which means rather than happily doing you know a, a seven a.m. to seven p.m. job mm. in the city, mm. you know. It, it's it's perhaps more, maybe I'll take the suburban role mm. still in financial services or whatever it is, but it's you know flexible working conditions and closer yep. to home and those sorts of things, which would clearly come at the cost of a yep. of a of a higher salary. So I, I mm. I'm interested in in understanding. I guess I'd be, I'd be keen to see you know how how much of it is is prejudice. I'd like to think that's mm. dropping, and how much of it is is. Circumstances. Circumstantial, yeah. I, I agree with you, Ray. I think it's it's more circumstances and I and I would say there are equally as many men wanting flexibility and, and taking the home care role as yeah. women um, after they've had a family. So most definitely um, I personally haven't really experienced any, um, you know, uh, derogatory attitude or missing out because of the fact that I am a working mother. Um, Even back in the 2000s? No, not, no, no, no. Not, not, not particularly. And okay. I guess I'll emphasise the purpose of, of what I have done and what, what I believe is, is, is critical is just supporting people, um, yeah. whether they're man or woman, but, um, you know, just just supporting each other in our career decisions, in, in sharing information, you know, knowledge and and what works what doesn't work and and helping each other through and I think that's that's the real passion that I have rather than seeing it as a platform to um you know change gender um biases or or any of those things whilst I I believe you know that, that that's important um generally out there you know and I would I would defend and be a feminist but just on a day-to-day basis for me it's more mm. around supporting other women um, with with doing their role doing it effectively mm. and whatever career tips um, that and experiences that I can share yeah um, to help others um, then you know that's what we should all be looking out for each other do do younger well as 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 women in in, in this kind of community as they mm. as they do develop their careers is it something that they're talking about in these forums to say well you know I would mm. like to to you know, start having a family, but I'm worried about how that works with work. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we at, at the peer group, the group that are, we very much um, stayed away from those sort of conversations. Okay. We wanted to be seen and known as um, as a professional group of women, uh, right? Um, but it was more around giving each other the heads up about things and support. So, um, from that respect, but at the few conference, um, not 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 particularly this year's, but in previous years, we've always had a question from the floor. You know, you have a panel of quite senior women in mm. management, you know, general management talking about their experiences and it's natural for people that are going through, um, you know, that that very unsettling stage when they're just having a young family, they want to know how others have, um, have coped with it. So yeah. um, that is also useful and I think, you know, it, it's probably something more one-on-one people are, are happy to share. Yeah, um, yeah. But everybody is so very different. Um, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, I, I again, I my, my heart starts to race when I talk about this stuff because I've got to be so careful, you know, kind of a, a young male and, you know, <laughs> I would have been seen as a problem. Oh, no. <laughs> no but it's good that we're having a, co- a conversation yeah. at all about it. I don't, I don't think... There, you know, there are that many conversations happening. Mm, so mm. Um, I think it's, I think it's a good thing. And I think, I think in financial services we're probably a lot better off than than many other industries. You know, we get very good pay levels, and yeah. we're, we're professional. We have good education behind us. I think we're in a really fortunate position to many other um, people. You know, women particularly, or mother, young families around around the place. But. Mm. Yeah. There's a there's a, again through through my degree I did spend a bit a bit of time on this um, mm. uh, and there's there's also this theory that that way back when uh, as as financial services uh, was evolving mm. you know it, it used to be very ego driven you used to be the stock picking guy and oh, you used yeah. to be able to pick the next best winner and you know yep. it used to be that kind of yep. bang your bang your uh, fists on your chest and really kind of yeah 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 all that stuff but mm. as as the industry evolves it if you if you actually look at the core of what advisors do and and you look at the conversations that the industries are having there's a lot of maternal uh elements that that are starting to come through so it's actually Mm. nurturing clients helping them understand their journey and really Mm. really facilitating Mm. people's lives and you know again you know i i wonder i wonder if that that then lends itself to being a bit more attractive for not just the the ego driven male but then you know mm-hmm. hmm. yeah is that is that interesting yeah 
I haven't probably thought of it like that, <laughs> but that's that's you, Ray. I like I like to have um, different different aspects on it. I mean, I think I mean I think the role of financial planning um, has changed a fair bit over yeah. the over the last 15, 20 years. I mean, the investment advice piece um, isn't so much the driving factor. It's more around understanding where the client is coming from, what they need, mm. um, how to get them, you know, to their goals. And and you're right, the conversations are a lot more you know, on a personal level that, you know, you want to get through a lot of the, those issues before you even start talking about money or products. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's evolved to become more strategic and, um, and, and more uh, around the, the client's perspective rather than them expecting the, the, the financial planner to have all the answers and have, you know, uh, just trust me, you know, I'll, I'll get you there. Yeah, sort yeah, of thing. yeah. Yeah, I'm smarter than the um, other And we, day. you know, and I think that <laughs> that might be too why we have seen more women coming through. Um, definitely seeing more fen- female financial planners, mm, mm. Um, more so than ever in the last, just even the last few years. Yeah, which is a really good sign. Yeah, um, yeah, it'd be su- I'm super super keen to see what that looks like going forward. I, and I, I'd like to think it'll start to even further represent mm. the demographics of, yeah. of society. And yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. It's in- it's interesting to kind of think about. But it does scare me as a as a white male to talk about this stuff. Cause <laughs> yeah. Don't be scared, Ray. It's okay. <laughs> um, but talking talking about um, you know strategy and those sorts of things, and because you you work with a a product provider as mm-hmm. a as a um, I guess distribution, yeah. do you do you find that um, when you when you do speak with advisors now that they 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 are focused on the product or they're actually interested in how the product lends itself to strategy opportunities and yeah most definitely the latter um yeah. most definitely strategies strategy led um is the way even yeah. uh even though you know I've been working on the um on a on a tax structure um product um the investment bond structure yeah um that is all around strategy um but even now I'm also looking after the direct property it's how to use that asset class in a portfolio and what does it do um, that other asset classes that it's different from other asset classes. So it's more around um, the you know the risks and the op- um, benefits of of using that particular type of mm. or style of fund. Yeah. And then more importantly, advisors want to know you know who are the types of clients that want to, that are that are suitable for this. Yeah. So in the old days um, of of talking about you know managed funds, you know you'd go in there and you just talk about the 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 shares in the portfolio and the returns and yeah, the so that's all a managed fund is, right? It's yeah. shares. The score, the, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. No, obviously, evolved a lot since then. Yeah. Um, but no, it's 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 what is it? What's relevant to you know the other person that you're speaking to? And and in my case, it's advisors. In the advisor's case, it's the client. So that's why I, I'm always cognizant of um, explaining um, what are the benefits and the strategy that's going to help that client mm. that you're talking to achieve a certain goal, whether it's, um, you know, um, h- nice income yield so that they can can be comfortable in retirement um, or they're um, having a long-term tax-effective um, investment plan to, to save for their first property or yeah. send their kids to private school, something like that. So, yeah, it's a lot – for me, it's a, it's a lot more rewarding and I'm finding I get a lot more um, – you know, engagement with advisors when um, then I can speak along the, the terms that they're they're thinking about as well. When, when you say property, it's you are. It, I, I know that it's a it's a, a leading question. It's mm. different to what most advisors would think of property being. Mm. You know, uh, sending your client to a buyer's agent and buying something in Brisbane. Yeah, <laughs> sure. The, the- so Centuria um, is a professional manager of commercial property, or in our case, office. Um, Direct property, so actually buying sole buildings. So office buildings. Office buildings yeah. um, and packaging them into a fixed-term fund um, with a set yield um, or an indicative yield um, and going to market. We do two to three of those per, per year. And then um, ongoing we have an open-ended diversified fund. So that's for people that are looking for um, exposure across many types of um, office buildings that's geographically split. Um, that has still has the monthly income, but it's um uh, it's also got a little bit of a liquidity facility as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because so, I imagine liquidity is you know these these things don't sell overnight, right? No, so you, you that's for your you know your long term or your super self managed super or your your long term part of the portfolio yep. that you know if there's a liquidity event. Uh, you don't need to necessarily get out and sell it all at once, but you you if you if you're in the right um, 
fund that's being managed properly with good tenants, low vacancy rates, long whale um, or weighted average lease expiry. <laughs> I'm learning all the uh, the techno jargon now. Yeah, yeah. Um, the then, love it. Um, then you know, you've got a better better chance of getting that um, boring, stable income coming through every month. Yeah. So how do, how does it work? Because th- is it literally going to uh, well? Finding or developing a building, and then and then literally saying, okay, we'll wrap that up into a, a, a fund, mm-hmm. and then you know, we're split into a, a hundred units, and the building's worth a hundred dollars. So we then, yeah. So uh, we don't tend to develop, as in buy a, an empty or a, a a a building that we knock down and rebuild. It's yeah. it's more acquiring something that's already standing. Okay. Um, and then um, we have um, so we have an acquisitions team that will go in and typically these days buy off market, which which is is important to look at because you know there's a whole lot of um, investors now. There's twenty or so buyers swarming the market every time a, a building comes up for sale. It's a very quite a tight. Yeah, held really. Market. Why is that? Yeah, just just um, property prices. I okay. mean, it's yeah, it's yeah. valuations. We've had the Sydney Metro um, project in Sydney take out seventeen buildings around the CBD. Yeah. So, um, so the, there's limited supply. Um, although we've had Barangaroo come on. Yeah, um, it's had, kind of different clients, though, isn't yeah, it? Because I yeah. I'm led to believe Barangaroo is more big big places, and yes. you've basically got a whole bunch of you know not smaller, but maybe fifty to hundred headcount. Yeah firms that are like, well, we can't go to Barangaroo. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we're, we're sort of seeing, you know, very low vacancy rates, very high rental yields coming in now. So mm. it's very difficult to find good value in the Sydney and Melbourne CBD. So to have relationships with um, other other holders of property mm. and to, to be able to transact off market um, yeah. is, is quite an advantage. Um, and yeah, and then we also have, in addition to the acquisitions team, a leasing and tenancy team. So okay. it's all about, you know, um, getting the most out of your tenants and, and building, um, you know, making sure the lifts are working, that the, um, the, the office, the building's in good repair, that you can, um, then negotiate longer leases, mm. um, and, and they'd be happy, you know, and get, get, you know, forewarning when they're, they're planning to leave, you know, well ahead of the, the contract and those sorts of things. So, and then the final step that we add value is in the refurb. So being able to completely, um, you know, renovate a building um, to yeah. add value to it as well, just like you would a residential, you know, investment property. Yeah. So those three things are important. Um, sticking to what you know, like sticking in your area of specialisation, which yeah. for us is is office. Um, we, we have something like... Um, Four billion dollars between yeah, it's um, big, isn't it? Yeah, between two listed REITs. Oh, actually, one of those listed REITs is a, an industrial fund. That's one billion. Uh, one billion in the CMA, the Metropolitan Office, and then two billion in unlisted. So that's across about fifteen single asset funds. Mm-hmm. And unlisted so. for wholesale investors. No, these are for retail okay. investors. Yeah, okay. so we do. Um, we offer both. Um, uh, you know, we'll have a basically a closed end period of time for to raise capital. Right. Um, so that means between fifty and a million dollars, and we'll go to market with um, our direct investors and advisors that have those types of investors. Yep. And make the offer, and then we close it out within. The, the last two we've done this year have closed out within two weeks. Wow. Um, so there's wow. a lot of demand, a lot of pent-up demand for this type of asset Yeah. Um, because uh, the, the type of investor that's going in there, they they tend to be, well, um, they're quite sophisticated. Yeah. They're quite averse uh, and they're looking, they like the, the higher yield. The yeah. yields are around about 7% that we've done on those two properties this year. Yeah, wow. So is there a yeah. particular type of advisor that, that gets attracted to this sort of stuff? I'm just sort of thinking because... You know, mm. this is, is sort of a unique opportunity to learn about because I, I a lot of the advisors that I, I know are in XY, uh, mm. you know, re- relatively traditional in, in, in yeah. the understanding of, of managed funds and ETFs yep. and those sorts of things. And this is maybe something that's a bit outside. Yeah, of, it's specialist. It's definitely a yeah. specialised um, area. Um, you know, uh, you know, the average super fund, the APRA fund would have 10% to direct property or to property and about 7% of that's listed. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about, you know, around about 3 to 5% of a portfolio. We're not sort of suggesting that it should be, yeah, a major um, part. But um, for some people that are comfortable with it, um, yeah. it's, an, it's a good alternative to shares. It's low correlated. Um, to the share market, um, a bit more stable in valuations only because they're not marked to market every day. Um, yeah. But, yeah, we also have the Diversified Property Fund, which is a managed fund okay. and it sits on platforms and it's more of a traditional um, style fund. 
Uh, it only has a monthly liquidity rate, um, but it still offers um, uh, that open-ended, ex- you know, allocation. It's got a long set recommended rating. Um, yeah. So we're working with licensees at the moment to have a look at that, where where they are um, interested in having a direct property allocation in their in the portfolio. Right, and then. <laughs> Is there any any complexities that uh, advisors need to think about? I guess from a, a licensee perspective, is there any sort of quirks? Um, look, it's like any any asset class. You know, know yeah. your know your product. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's there's things about property that you, you know that you want to get your head around, like what the what the um, the yields mean. Mm. That there is tax effectiveness in terms of the income that's pay- payable, so tax deferred income. So it's not just shares that pay tax tax effective income. Mm. Um, the risks risks of liquidity we've talked about, gearing. You know, um, what 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 how that all you know interacts and and the quality of the buildings and and how the managers um and you know obviously a, a research house like Lonsec would is all over that and can be used for um you know for for a reference point for advisors yeah interesting um yeah i uh i i i got to be honest i'm not i'm not so familiar with with the world of of unlisted property mm. but uh i i i my sense is i i you know i, I do work with a couple of of wholesale clients and I know that often if if you if you're just doing the 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 bread and butter basics from an investment perspective often it's there, there is a little bit of something that you need to do or, mm. or there is a demand for something that's a little bit different yep um if for no other reason than than the narrative or a bit of sizzle you know um and, yep. and you know so long as I guess that's that's done in the context of, of the overall yeah if they understand you know that yeah. to get a seven percent yield when term deposits you know are paying 2.38 yeah, percent basically then, inflation you know <laughs> so there there's a risk to that and uh, with with all reward comes comes those and, yeah. and then to then to understand how that's managed if it's not not a big part of the portfolio, then you know it's not such a big deal, and yeah. and other other ways that can be mitigated. So, yeah, it's just I think I think I'd always say to advisors, just you know, invest what you're comfortable with, yeah, and what you 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 know, and, and work with us if you want to know more. Um, you know, we're here to help, yeah, and you've got good research coming out as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah awesome. So, um. From bonds to property, what were you doing before bonds? I actually don't don't know the answer to this question. Ah, um, well, I worked as a national key account manager for Perpetual. Okay. Um, so I worked with the large aligned groups um, that were the key clients back then, yeah. um, such as Commonwealth Bank, IWF, yeah. ING groups um, count, which was separate to CBA back then. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah that so was the merger with their accounting. That's business. right. Yeah, 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 account, yeah. Um, count became listed and then it was acquired by Commonwealth Bank. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, different roles throughout the, the time. I've worked for a, a startup as well okay. back in, um, uh, uh, when was this? Around about two, early 2000s, I did a startup distribution company that um, did um, third party distribution for brands that weren't familiar in Australia, such as Lazard. And Aberdeen and Hyperion, which of course are now hi- household names. Yeah, today. wow. Okay. Um, and what was that like working at a at a startup? It was fun. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. Not only that, but it was an all female team. <laughs> nice. So um, we had a lot of fun. Was um, it in Sydney? Yeah, it was in Sydney. When, when was yeah, it? Two thousand and four to two thousand and eight. Okay. Um, Gee. <laughs> and it was really, yeah, what a period. yeah, yeah. It was good fun, um, and we raised some really good money for for um, our our clients there, um, and had fun along the way. So yeah, yeah. There's always different different things to do in this in this uh, profession. I think it's yeah. it's really rewarding. Um, is there is there a particular sort of space that really gets you excited about where where the the financial world is is looking at tomorrow? I mean, mm-hmm. for for us, you know, we, we technology is the mm-hmm. the well well beaten drum. I think a lot of us now are, are looking at, at education and, and those sorts of things. Yep. I've probably got a, a few views on on that. Mm. Um, and then clearly we've got the the RC going on in the background, and that's that's stirring the pot and you know that's asking right. some interesting questions. So yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Have you sort of got a view on you know what what our tomorrow looks like, and we can crystal ball and? <laughs> oh wow, I love doing that. That's good <laughs> yeah, fun. Yeah. 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 Um, well, you know, I think the the, the Royal Commission um, has. Look, it's talked about things that I think it's fair to say everyone in most people in the industry were w- well aware of. Yeah, it's more just making the public aware now. Um, and I think that um, you know we're going to see 
uh, more professionalism and, 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 I mean, who knows what will happen with the um, the large institutions owning advice. Yeah. Um, we've already seen, you know, Commonwealth Bank plan to divest. Um, to divest of their? Of financial planning. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. they're going to go into a listed, another entity. Yep. Um, and also. Um, is that happening. CFS? Yes, yep. CFS. Yeah, yeah. That's yep. right. And um, the same is happening within, um, well, BT has, has, has not made any major announcements right. uh, as yet. But um, In terms of extracting themselves yeah, out of Westpac? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it's, it's very interesting that, that I think that, and, and also even, even down to the, um, I read this week around the managed discretionary accounts section with um, the, um, the, the Sam Henderson case and the, the, the model there um, of internal yeah. verti vertically integrated models. So I think it's all up for grabs. Um, there's that. There's also the, um, the grandfathering of the trail commission um, issue, which which could could very much impact the the valuations of yeah. of the books of businesses that might be sold yeah. um, by the older planners exiting because of the education that requirements. Yeah, I wonder. In. I wonder if there's some some decent deals to get done at the moment if you're looking to, to mm. expand your business, right? You know, if you're a retiring advisor, you'd be pretty nervous, I imagine. Yeah, I think so. I think mm. so because the reason why they're on such high multiples, they're on multiples. An accounting firm is on a multiple of just under um, one times yeah. revenue. Um, these days the multiple are around about two and a half times. And the reason for that is because advisors are um, getting that recurring income through the trail commission yep. or the, the they're on platform and they've got it all coming through. Mm. So if you sort of take away a chunk of that, um, I mean, many of the um, fee-for-service models uh, at quality advice firms are not so much reliant on those old trail commissions these days. I mean, yeah. it was a while ago now, but um, the the ones that have built a large book that are sitting on that recurring revenue could be at threat, yeah. or at least that portion could be. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of um, smaller licensees coming out, a lot of change coming through. You know, we had the Dover um, breakup um, and we have, uh, you know, several other group, larger groups um, also under suspicion and, and investigation by ASIC at the moment as well. Yeah. So um, we're seeing the, the you know, this proliferation of smaller licences mm. uh, banding together at this, at this stage. But, you know, we may even go to individual licensed um Individually advisors. licensed advisory mm. firms, yeah. I... I, I did a study tour in uh, the US in 2014 and I looked at, at the way that their world works. So in Australia, we've got an inherent fiduciary obligation for to our clients, mm. um, which, you know, all advisors in Australia would be very familiar with, but it's not necessarily the case in the US. Mm. If you're if you're a US advisor and you work in what they call a wirehouse, so like a... Mm like a, a stockbroker, yeah. you, you don't you don't have a fiduciary obligation. And, and what that means is that if, if an, a client comes to see and says, look, I've got a, a, a bunch of money that I would like invested, um, can you please do it? There's no, there's no obligation or, um, uh, or, or, or perception that, that you will go to market and understand the various options. It's more that mm. you have a solution in-house and that Client is coming to you and uh, mm. and is expecting that in-house solution. Yeah. As opposed, and, but they still do have the, the what they call RIAs, um, where you know it's like us or, or every other advisor in Australia, where you know you've got that obligation to go around. And I just I just wonder if if this conversation starts to in Australia starts to get a little noisy. So if you know if you're if you're an AMP advisor and and you know somebody comes to you at, at AMP, I, I just wonder if there would be. Well, I, I feel like there is the expectation on the client to some extent that you would be providing A and P advice, mm. and to to That's say right. to say, oh no no no, CBA is actually the one you know that I've researched, and you know I just I I wonder where where that that sits because, mm. I, and 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 it's it's a sort of a long long winded way of, of of sort of thinking about it, but you know is I I, I wonder if there is space for the non fiduciary component to yeah. be in Australia to say look this is the things that we believe in and these are the things that we do it doesn't suit everybody mm. but there's a, I, and I guess it's around being really clear around that mm. yeah yeah I mean there's a lot of distinction well um, looking at the difference between general advice and personal advice. Um, but I think you were referring to personal advice from yeah. one institution. Yeah. 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 So and that's um, how it used, you know, that's pretty much how it used to be. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think, I think where it has broken down is that we 
have tried to to give um, you know the consumer all this choice, and yeah. the advisor wants to to be able to give them all different products and sitting on different platforms and things. But there's been so much compliance around how you disclose yeah. the conflicts or disclose it that it just the document this SOA just becomes this long winded thing that the client ends up finding difficult to understand mm. and appreciate. Um, and then it's not so clear then, you know, what is um, actually, yeah. um, you know, in the interest of the advisor rather than the client. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not always clear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's what this whole best interest, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't believe I went to um, a roadshow in July for the FPA and there was, you know, half an hour spent on best interests. Mm. And I thought, well, hang on, this all came out five years ago when we had FOFA. Um, I'm surprised that we're having to go through this, and yeah. and it's be- you know I guess it's because it's not been followed or interpreted correctly. Yeah, and that's you know is that is that our fault as an industry, or you know do we need more more guidelines, or has this you know really been tested before now? Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, no, I or or is it is it maybe the case where if you are a, a, a an aligned advisor but it's not clear how you're aligned, then, then mm. you know, the, the client's been uh, uh, deceived. So maybe mm. that's, that's kind of what it's, what it's picking up. Mm. But, you know, and, and the reason I, I was sort of mm. wanting to, to stay on that is uh, with, with the colonial first state thing is if you're a colonial first state advisor and you uh, have an obligation to go to market, then in terms of where, where the products or what products you recommend, that's fine, mm. but clearly that's going to increase the cost to serve. Mm. However, if you're a colonial first state advisor and you say, all I'm going to ever recommend is colonial first aid and it's not appropriate for everyone, but I can let you know the pros and cons relative to you, mm. you know, I, I, I would suggest that that would lend itself to a, a, a lower cost model. And so long as it's clear, I, yeah. I don't know that I, and I don't know if this is, I, I don't know that there is, or I don't no. understand if there is. No. Yeah. No. No, I don't think so. It's just that the, although in best interests duty, whether you could say, you know, you'd have to still know where the client was coming from, yeah, and and whether this product that you're recommending is is better. Clearly, you need to tell them the pros and yeah. cons. Like, if you're yeah. a retiree and all I do is invest in startups, I need mm. to tell you that you mm. don't look like a lot of my normal <laughs> clients. And yeah. I'm not necessarily saying it's, but like, just be clear that you're the startup guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's right. And it's knowing those right questions, I guess, to yeah. ask and define it. And I think the traditional way of risk um, profiling that advisors have followed has been around, you know, whether they're a, a balance to growth or a, mm. and, you know, does that necessarily give you, the as the advisor, the right yep. direction? Yep, yep. Um, and are they understanding what, what risk actually is? Yeah. Um, so there's another area. So, nice. Super, super tough. I, I heard a story where uh, a client had a, a small portfolio. I, I think it was like twenty five grand retiree in her eighties. Uh, I can't remember what product, but it was one of the the larger ones. And she mm. she'd called an advisor and said, "Hey, I um I've not heard from anyone for a while. It's fine, um, but I I'm just keen to make sure that there's there's nothing wrong with what I'm going on in place. You know, I've got a statement, so I thought I'd jump on the phone. Yeah. Uh, and then the advisor had a look, and it turned out that the portfolio was a hundred percent Aussie equities. Mm-hmm. And she's drawing an income. So clearly there's a conversation to be had. Yeah. However, and, and the conversation was had to say that, you know, you're in shares and often clients look at and say, like, all right, well, how do we, how do we go about this? And the, the advisor needed to send a, a full fact find document, a full risk profiling survey, uh, mm. you know, all the, all the file notes. Uh, and clearly, unless, unless the business copped the cost of that work, would need to also ask the client to write a check, mm. which makes me really upset because you've mm. got an eighty-year-old lady who just wants to know whether or not she's done the right thing. There's no, there's no revenue opportunity or, or no motive in terms of what the advisor is wanting to do beyond answering a simple question. Mm. But the regulatory framework yeah. requires, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps. Mm. And I just don't know that it's conducive with growing that twenty percent of Australians who no. get advice to. I agree with you, Ray. I totally agree. I, I don't have the answer. Yeah, <laughs> come I on. I wish I had all the answers. <laughs> come on. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that, and I think that that's what would um, attract more and more planners as well in, yeah. if they could see that, you know, because I'm, I'm hearing it every day, just the, the burden of all of the compliance and the work and the time and the SOA production and and, and then how much it actually costs mm. to then say to a client, you know, you really need to be paying me, you know, 
hundreds and or thousands of dollars for this piece, this one piece yeah. of advice. Yeah. If it's, if it's worth all that time I, I take, and yeah, there needs to be a, a better way. Something in between, and that, that's mm. why I keep going back to that US. It's like you know, if I if I clearly represent a you know a a product suite or a, mm. or a solution. Does that fiduciary obligation create a barrier? And I, I, I mm. it, it feels simple. And I just don't know what I'm missing. Yeah. So yep. yeah, maybe something we can talk about for the part B when we yes. get in here in a few Definitely. weeks. Definitely, <laughs> that sounds great. Cool. Well, <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate it, Alison. Thank you so much for for taking the time. Um, and for anyone who uh, wants to get in contact with you or, or yeah. chat to you a little further, is is there a yep. a way for them to best do it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. Is that a good way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alison McFarlane. And I also wanted to put in a plug too. There's a Women yeah. and Wealth Breakfast for the FPA Sydney chapter um, on Wednesday, the 17th of October. Uh, guest speaker is Dr. Hill, Jill, Dr. Jill Hicks. She was the lady that was in the London bombing and oh, um, wow. became an amputee a few years ago, the terrorist attack. Yes. Yeah, Very yeah. inspirational woman. That's a breakfast. And also financial executive women um, had a few circle. A circle is where they can get together and um, actually discuss issues um, and questions as a group. Um, actually, it was on yesterday in Brisbane. So sorry, Brisbane. But um, so, so, but, but I feel like that might be something that people are interested in. So so few is the uh, female executive. Yeah, financial executive oh, women. Yep, 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 Jump yep. online um, and check them out. You can join. There's a discount for FPA members um, yeah. and, um, and yeah, we'd love to see as many planners get on board with that and, um, you know, and the men are welcome to our events as well, right? Oh, so it's not just women? No, no, no. No, no we don't, okay. we don't just, you know, discriminate. <laughs> but, um, no, but thank you so much. No, not at all. And, and for, for people who are listening and, and keen to catch up with Alison, she's far from scary. Um, but, you know, I, otherwise uh, pop, pop a couple of notes in Facebook. I'm sure Alison will happily, happily get back to you. But um, thanks so much. Have a lovely weekend and, and really thank appreciate you. it. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks.